So I started asking myself, why haven't we been able to do better? And the answer to me is obvious. We're treating cancer too late in the game, when it's already established, and oftentimes it's already spread or metastasized. And as a doctor, I know that once a disease progresses to an advanced stage, achieving a cure can be difficult, if not impossible. So I went back to the biology of angiogenesis and started thinking, could the answer to cancer be preventing angiogenesis, beating cancer at its own game, so that cancers could never become dangerous? This could help healthy people, as well as people who have already beaten cancer once or twice and want to find a way to keep it from coming back. So to look for a way to prevent angiogenesis in cancer, I went back to look at cancer's causes. And what really intrigued me was when I saw that diet accounts for 30 to 35 percent of environmentally caused cancers. Now the obvious thing is to think about what we could remove from our diet, what to strip out, take away. But I actually took a completely opposite approach and began asking, what could we be adding to our diet that's naturally antiangiogenic, that could boost the body's defense system and beat back those blood vessels that are feeding cancers? In other words, can we eat to starve cancer? Well, the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you how. And our search for this has taken us to the market, the farm, and to the spice cabinet, because what we've discovered is that Mother Nature has laced a large number of foods and beverages and herbs with naturally occurring inhibitors of angiogenesis. So here's a test system we developed. Uh, at the center is a ring from which hundreds of blood vessels are growing out in a starburst fashion. And we can use this system to test dietary factors at concentrations that are attainable by eating. So let me show you what happens when we put in an extract from red grapes, the active ingredient resveratrol. It's also found in red wine. This inhibits abnormal angiogenesis by 60%. Here's what happens when we add an extract from strawberries. It potently inhibits angiogenesis. An extract from soybeans. And here is a growing list of our anti-angiogenic foods and beverages that we're interested in studying. And for each food type, we believe that there's different potencies within different strains and varietals. And we want to measure this because, well, while you're eating a strawberry or drinking tea, why not select the one that's most potent for preventing cancer? So here are four different teas that we've tested. They're all common ones. Chinese jasmine, Japanese sencha, Earl Grey, and a special blend that we prepared. And you can see clearly that the teas vary in their potency from less potent to more potent. But what's very cool is when we actually combine the two less potent teas together, the combination, the blend, is more potent than either one alone. This means there's food synergy. Here's some more data from our testing. Now in the lab, we can simulate tumor angiogenesis represented here in a black bar. And using this system, we can test the potency of cancer drugs. So the shorter the bar, less angiogenesis, that's good. And here are some common drugs that have been associated with reducing the risk of cancer in people. Statins, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and a few others, they inhibit angiogenesis too. And here are the dietary factors going head to head against these drugs. You can see they clearly hold their own, and in some cases, they're more potent than the actual drugs. Soy, parsley, garlic, grapes, berries. I could go home and cook a tasty meal using these ingredients. So imagine if we could create the world's first rating system in which we could score foods according to their anti-angiogenic cancer preventative properties. And that's what we're doing right now. Now I've shown you a bunch of lab data, and so the real question is what is the evidence in people that eating certain foods can reduce angiogenesis in cancer. Well, the best example I know is a study of 79,000 men followed over 20 years, in which it was found that men who consumed cooked tomatoes two to three times a week had up to a 50% reduction in their risk of developing prostate cancer. Now, we know that tomatoes are a good source of lycopene, and lycopene is anti-angiogenic. But what's even more interesting from this study is that in those men who did develop prostate cancer, those who ate more servings of tomato sauce 
actually had fewer blood vessels feeding their cancer. So this human study is a prime example of how antiandrogenic substances present in food and consumed in practical levels can impact on cancer. And we're now studying the role of a healthy diet with Dean Ornish at UCSF and Tufts University on the role of this healthy diet on markers of angiogenesis that we can find in the bloodstream. Now obviously, uh, what I've shared with you has some far-ranging implications even beyond cancer research because if we're right, it could impact on consumer education, food services, public health, and even the insurance industry. And in fact, some insurance companies are already beginning to think along these lines. Check out this ad from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. And for many people around the world, dietary cancer prevention may be the only practical solution because not everybody can afford expensive end-stage cancer treatments, but everybody could benefit from a healthy diet based on local, sustainable, anti-angiogenic crops. Now, finally, I've talked to you about food, and I've talked to you about cancer, so there's just one more disease that I have to tell you about, and that's obesity. Because it turns out that adipose tissue, fat, is highly angiogenesis dependent. And like a tumor, fat grows when blood vessels grow. So the question is, can we shrink fat by cutting off its blood supply? So the top curve shows the body weight of a genetically obese mouse that eats nonstop until it turns fat like this furry tennis ball. And the bottom curve is the weight of a normal mouse. If you take the obese mouse and give it an angiogenesis inhibitor, it loses weight. Stop the treatment, gains the weight back. Restart the treatment, loses the weight again. Stop the treatment, gains the weight back. And in fact, you can cycle the weight up and down simply by inhibiting angiogenesis. So this approach that we're taking for cancer prevention may also have an application for obesity. The really truly interesting thing about this is that we can't take these obese mice and make them lose more weight than what the normal mouse's weight is supposed to be. In other words, we can't create supermodel mice. <laughs> and this speaks to the role of angiogenesis in regulating healthy set points. Albert St. Georgie once said that discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. I hope I've convinced you that for diseases like cancer, obesity, and other conditions, that there may be a great power in attacking their common denominator, angiogenesis. And that's what I think the world needs now. Thank you.